beginning with the overview of the Greeks, the first thing I want to comment on here is how Western historians usually frame the entire story of science. Now, you may already have a problem with what I just said. You might say that, well, you're talking about Western historians, so generally, how can you make a statement about all Western historians? Well, I'm specifically talking about those Western historians who are writing about the history of science. And the reason I came to this conclusion is that when I just simply looked at the most mainstream, the most standard books that I could find on this topic, I found David Lindbergh's Beginnings of Western Science and Edward Grant's Foundation of Modern Science in the Middle Ages. So first, obviously, I checked the reviews and uh, you know the commentary on these books by other scholars. And then what I did was I just took these books, put the titles in Google, and typed the word syllabus with it and pressed enter. On the first page on my Google results, there's like 10, 15 results, I got three hits of university courses, one from MIT, another from UPenn, and another from University of Pittsburgh. That's just like the top results on my first page. So obviously these, these books are being taught and studied widely. Okay, so but then what's the problem with that, right? Well, the problem is that Grant and Lindbergh are pushing an agenda that George Saliba, who's a professor of Islamic history and Islamic science at Columbia, calls the classical narrative. And this narrative dictates that all credit for modern science be given to Western civilization. To give you a sense of how aggressive the language is of these historians when they're talking about this issue, here's a quote by Edward Grant. Quote, Although science has a long history with roots in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, it is indisputable that modern science emerged in the 17th century in Western Europe and nowhere else. End quote. Okay, so first of all, whenever a historian uses the word indisputable, that should be a clear red flag. If any historian wants to use that word to describe his or her research, then they're in the wrong game. They should be working in the math department, coming up with mathematical proofs and theorems. Secondly, there's nothing indisputable about this claim that Grant just made here, as we will see when we get to the Islamic section after this with George Saliba's work, who makes very convincing arguments which expose the biases here. But anyways, let's first actually see what the Greeks were doing, because this is what Grant and Lindbergh claim is the inspiration for modern science, not the Muslim era advancements. So according to David Lindbergh, early in the 6th century BC, Greece experienced a sort of enlightenment, and usually this period is seen as unprecedented in human history up to that point. This is when the Greeks began to question their cultural mythology, which was built around a pantheon of gods who controlled the cosmos. And they did this through their divine intervention and very dramatic intrigues. This was basically like the Thor comic books. That's what they actually believed in. Now, Lindbergh says that the Greeks replaced this cosmic drama with rationalism and a concern for evidence. And I agree with the first part. They were definitely rational. But a concern for evidence? Not so much. And we'll see why. Lindbergh quotes Aristotle, who describes the birth of philosophy in Greece as purely materialistic. This is a position in the class of monism in philosophy. Monism is the idea that everything is basically one type of thing, either matter or mind, but not both. Notice the deductive approach here, which makes absolute statements as opposed to an empirical one, which focuses on humbly gathering evidence and building a testable theory. So the first Greek rationalists chose matter as their only thing, or only type of thing. Then in the 5th century BC, this materialism of the Greeks developed further into the atomism of Leucippus and Democritus. According to these guys, atoms are the fundamental building blocks of everything in the universe. This is a fairly impressive idea, especially considering this is coming from human beings 2,500 years ago. It was an exercise in rigorous logic. However, around this time, disagreements also emerged, and two new philosophical positions were born. The first one was by this philosopher called Empedocles, who said the universe is composed of four material elements, fire, air, earth, water, but also two additional non-material elements, namely love and strife. And these two, I guess you could say spiritual elements, these are the ones that do the heavy lifting in his model. They provide the ultimate causal reason, the the meaning behind the why questions behind the mechanics. Now, this introduction of love and strife 
may seem silly to us, but you have to understand the gravity of the problems that these early philosophers were trying to deal with. These are not easy problems, and we have in no way solved them even today. In fact, we're not even close, and by the time we're done with the final section, which is on modern science, we'll see why. In any case, the other new position to atomism came from the Pythagoreans, who went in a completely different direction. These guys, which should be evident from their name, believe that the ultimate reality is numerical, rather than material. So according to them, only numbers are ultimately real. So these were the three main philosophical positions around this time of the 5th century BC in Greece. Along with these questions of what the fundamental nature of existence is, another problem the Greek philosophers were starting to deal with, which is much more down to earth and yet very complicated, is that of motion and change. When dealing with this issue, which is now getting us closer to the realm of actual science, they encountered a very serious logical problem. One of the famous, or maybe I should say infamous, philosophers during this time was called Zeno. And he made up these riddles and paradoxes, basically just to piss off other philosophers. One of his infamous paradoxes was the one in which Zeno argued that it's impossible to ever walk across a stadium. Because before you walk across the whole stadium, you must first walk across half of it. And before you cover the half, you must cover the quarter. And before the quarter, you have to cover the eighth, and so on, to infinity. To walk across the entire stadium is therefore to traverse an infinite sequence of halves, and it is impossible to traverse an infinity of intervals in finite time, from which it follows that all motion is impossible. We had some questions regarding this paradox for our resident scientist friend Yasser, and here's a clip of that discussion. So one thing I want to ask Yasser about this is, does, does modern calculus solve such paradoxes? Because it deals with summing over infinity, right? So isn't this basically a limit problem that we deal with in calculus every day now? So absolutely, this problem has definitely been solved by modern calculus. In fact, not just one way. As you uh, hinted, uh, one way to uh, sum up infinities is to treat it as a limit problem. So this is so this can be solved. That's the traditional way to solve it. But in fact, more recently, a new form of calculus has also been invented, which is uh, smooth infinitesimal analysis, where you can actually solve it in a different way, consistent, different. So uh, certainly this problem of uh, infinities has been solved. I know that when um, Newton came up with calculus, uh, a lot of the mathematicians were very, um, I wouldn't say dismissive, but they were kind of angry because uh, they had... There, first of all, there was no proof, I think, that he provided for some of the techniques that he, um, that, that he, that he used. I'm not sure if mathematicians... Math was not very rigorous at the point. So George Berkeley, I think, had a problem with calculus. Yeah, a lot of people had because it was very... Uh, it wasn't a rigorous derived process. But math at the time was not very rigorous. Yet for many years after calculus was introduced many mathematicians continued to have uh, misgivings about it because its foundations were not rigorously proved. I'm just thinking like this is, I mean, think about the genius of Zeno and Parmenides, right? I mean, these guys came up with a paradox that stumped not just philosophers, but mathematicians up to the point of... Uh... Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. But what I find interesting is what was uh, Zeno's own thinking about this? Was he simply being whimsical to poke holes into the philosophies of the preceding philosophers, challenging them to better explain their models? Did he believe that actually motion was possible or did he actually believe that uh, motion is an illusion? So that was a very good question by Yasser. Was Zeno actually serious? Did he actually believe that motion is impossible? Or is this just a case of philosophical arsonism where Zeno is just tearing down the ideas of his competitors for fun? Well, this is actually not a very simple question to answer because Zeno's motivations are still debated to this day. Because they were also debated by other Greek philosophers in his own time who accused him of just being a pain in their ass just to defend his teacher Parmenides and his Iliadic school of thought. The Iliadics made this very radical claim that all is one. Not one type of thing, but literally one thing. Everything is just one thing. It's not a dispersed collection of atoms, and it's not a distinct set of integers. 
And it's not like some mixture between matter and spirit. Everything is just one thing. And when our senses perceive these distinctions, when we look around and we see distinct objects, right? All of this is just an illusion. Yeah, that's, uh, that's about as radical as it gets philosophically. And this is, I guess you could say this is kind of like an extreme position of monism, right? If you're not, you're arguing for one thing, like unity, but it's an extreme unity. It's not just a unity of um, one type of thing, but literally everything is one thing, which is like, I don't, it's hard for me to, uh, like, I'm not a big fan of this. However, um, I have a friend who, who's a fan of Parmenides. So, you know, there you go. But obviously, Parmenides was heavily criticized for this idea, and Zeno's main job, it appears to scholars today, was primarily to defend Parmenides by counterattacking the other philosophical positions, by exposing logical contradictions in their foundations. Whatever his motivations, though, Zeno's denial of the possibility of change through his paradoxes was extremely influential, because it really challenged the intellectuals of the time to basically up their game, right? The atomists, the Pythagoreans, and Empedocles all had to defend their models against these paradoxes and come up with logical solutions that were consistent with their models. And as we mentioned in the discussion, these paradoxes were so powerful that they weren't adequately resolved until the advent of modern rigorous mathematics. In fact, like there are even philosophers today who still aren't convinced by the mathematical resolutions, and they claim that those resolutions only work within the framework of math. And if you're surprised at how philosophers can get away with attacking the justifications of uh, mathematicians, you'll have to wait until the last section of the series where we deal with the foundations of mathematics itself, which it turns out that those foundations are themselves paradoxical. But that's all I'm going to say about that right now. So moving right along, the common theme up until this point in Greece, as you might have noticed, is the emphasis given to logic over evidence. All these philosophers were focusing on concepts that they could never really test. They were just coming up with these radical ideas without any real concern for actually testing which of those ideas were correct. One of the reasons for this was their hostility to sensory data, which is what we humans rely on primarily to gather evidence as we go about our daily lives. As a side note, by the way, out of all of these early Greek philosophers, only Empedocles, the the spiritualist dude, he's the only one who defended the senses. In any case, eventually there came the first great heavyweight of Greek philosophy, Socrates, and by extension, his famous student Plato. Now, like Zeno and Parmenides, the Platonic philosophers were also very dismissive of the senses. And this is like an extreme skepticism, right? I mean, if these guys were ever part of a jury, they would never trust eyewitness testimony, ever. Like, they, they, would, they would just throw it out. If, if your case is based on eyewitness testimony, you're going to jail. And that's true for all of these philosophers up till this point, uh, besides Empedocles, I guess. Anyway, so the Platonic philosophers, for them, the ultimate reality resides in this pure world of forms where perfect ideas like that of a perfect triangle live. So the way they would explain this is that you and I can draw a triangle, but it's never going to be perfect, right? It would always be a crude representation of a perfect idea, that idea of a perfect triangle, that's what lives in this world of pure form. And that world is far removed from our own. Think of this as like a heaven of pure ideas, where all the roots of all the ideas that our minds can ever have live forever, eternally. By doing this, Plato just reintroduced the supernatural back into Greek philosophy. Because by positing this place which transcends our plane of existence, that's what supernaturalism is, right? A very famous example of Platonic philosophy to help us understand a little more about what they meant is uh, the allegory of the cave. In this analogy, the example is given of some people who were born in a cave and have never seen the world outside their cave. And consequently, they don't believe that anything exists outside their cave. That's their entire world. That's their universe, the cave. The scary part is that Plato, through Socrates and his Republic, use this cave analogy to describe our own existence. His point is that if sensory data fail the people in the cave, why are we so certain that our senses are not lying to us? You know, if we believe that all that exists is what we can see and hear and taste and touch, how do we know we're not living in the matrix? Like, how do you know that you're not? 
The people inside the cave didn't know. This idea has been very influential, not just philosophically, but culturally as well, and I discussed it with Nabil and Yasser, so here's us ranting about it. Yeah, so for me, my understanding might be possible that other people might have interpreted the same way, but my understanding of Plato's cave analogy is that cave is the mind. And what I mean by that is that the human mind feels, hears, sees, understands according to its senses. And that is its boundary. That is the human mind's limitation. Let's say you try to expand your horizon by knowledge. But for a human mind going beyond its boundary, it feels uncertainty. It feels there might be chaos. Outside the comfort zone. Right? Outside the comfort zone, yes. So what it does is it recedes back within its cave, where it feels safe, where it feels normal. Let's take Grant and Lindbergh, for example, and the yeah. quote that, they, that we discussed about earlier, that Western Europe was the birth of science. Yeah, and, and it, that's it. Nowhere else. Yeah. That's it, right? So for me, Grant and Lindbergh have a limitation that they have put in, and they cannot go beyond that boundary. I'll give another example. Let's take the movie Shawshank Redemption. Remember the guy who... Um, the old guy. The old guy with the crow, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Can't so his when he leaves the prison, for him, his mind couldn't take the reality that was placed before him. Yeah, beyond the prison. Because he had become beyond, institutionalized. Yeah, he prison. has become institutionalized. So he commits suicide because that was too much for him. And regarding the movie The Matrix... We can see that for Neo, once he goes from his normal mundane life to what Morpheus shows him, what the real world looks like, he couldn't take it. He says, this is not for me. This is too much. His first initial reaction was fear. Yeah, his first uh, initial reaction was fear, then denial, and he goes all bonkers, right? Yeah, yeah. And also the guy, remember the guy, what was his name? Cypher. Uh, Cypher, okay. exactly. Cypher guy who right? basically tries so, to... So Cypher knew about the reality and he wants to go back into the Matrix where he feels safe and where he wants to live a life like, you know, Just a movie star. Steaks, eating yeah. steaks. Eating and steaks like... and movie, uh, being a movie star, right? So for him, that is the way I perceive. That's his cape. Yeah, that is his cape. So that's my understanding of Plato's cave analogy. Yeah. I mean, right. it's a very interesting concept that shows up everywhere in I mean well not everywhere but like this is present in our daily lives too right we Plato's real point was that we all live inside the cave and like you said you're saying basically that the mind is the cave the human mind is the cave. yes exactly so for us the human mind is the cave and we have put restrictions constraint on our mind and we can we are we are the prisoner to to our own mind in a way I think we have put these limitations on ourselves I think a lot of uh, religious paradigms yeah. also parallel this. Exactly. For there example, uh, knowledge that humans can have about the universe is uh, limited. And if, if, because we are living in a cave, limited by our senses, uh, limited by our minds, and to transcend that, just as Morpheus introduces knowledge to Neo, you require revelation. Yeah. yeah, something which, uh, transcending, transcending yeah, the cave. Yeah. Right, and uh, which cannot be accessed from inside the cave. So that was us ranting about the implications of Platonism. And as you can see, these ideas aren't just classical philosophy. They are very much present in our culture even today. And I would say even in modern physics, as we will discuss later on in the final sections. Anyways, another feature of Plato's reintroduction of the supernatural into philosophy was that he also brought back divinity into the mix. According to Plato, the world was created by a craftsman god who was the ultimate mathematician. This wasn't an omnipotent god like our Abrahamic religions who can create matter from nothing. What Plato's god did was to take all the chaotic matter of the universe that was already present somehow and impose order on it. The reason why these Platonists were doing all of this is because, according to Lindbergh, they were repulsed by the pure materialism of the atomists. So in that sense, their motivations were the same as Empedocles and, uh, I guess, Parmenides too. That machine-type universe of the atomists clearly pissed off a lot of philosophers because uh, 
And it, it it's kind of easy to see why, right? There's no explanation there for the order and the regularity of the cosmos. It's just taken as a given. And that's why they ultimately had to reintroduce supernaturalism just to kind of make up for this missing ingredient. Although this time, granted, they did make it very rational. It wasn't the chaotic Greek mythology of Zeus and Thor running around beating monsters or whatever. And finally, Aristotle arose as the final philosophical prophet of the Greeks. And one of the many things that Aristotle did was introduce some semblance of empiricism, finally. That's a focus on sensory data and collection of data. For example, he basically dismissed Zeno's paradoxes simply by saying that our senses can see motion happening and thus motion is clearly not impossible, period. End of story. Now, granted, that might be a little too casual, as we've seen Zeno's paradoxes are actually very powerful, but nevertheless, I mean, that's still um, a, a trait that endeared Aristotle to future scientists and philosophers, uh, including Muslim scientists and Christian philosophers. As for what Aristotle actually said, well, he said a lot. And his ethics, physics, and metaphysics is a very long topic, and we're not going to cover any of its minute details. In fact, we're not going to cover any of its details, except to say what is most relevant about Aristotle here, for our thesis, and that is his lack of experimentation. Even though he did give much more importance to empirical data than his predecessors, he was still far from a modern scientist. Lindbergh says here, quote, A feature of Aristotle's scientific practice that has puzzled and distressed modern commentators and critics namely the absence from his work of anything resembling controlled experimentation, end quote. However, Lindbergh then goes on to basically dismiss the importance of controlled experimentation. He just relegates it to a matter-of-fact occurrence, rather than a fundamentally important shift in human intellectual history. He does this by stating the following, quote, Experimental science emerged not when, at long last, the human race produced somebody clever enough to perceive that artificial conditions would assist in the exploration of nature, but when a rich variety of conditions were fulfilled, including the emergence of questions to which such a procedure promised to provide answers. End quote. It seems here that Lindbergh is just dismissing the importance of experimentation because A, the Greeks didn't really bother with it, and B, the Muslims who came later did. And by dismissing the importance of controlled experimentation as something not very clever, he's basically dismissing the Muslim contribution to science, which came after, as we will see. For now, though, we want to get Yasser to explain the importance of experimentation to modern science, and here's a clip of that discussion. Uh, one aspect of science is the theories, the scientific theories, which will give you a structure for how we believe the world works. Okay. Experiments are how you test those theories. Without experiments, all theories which are self-consistent stand on an equal footing. Without having the tool of experimentation, you're not able to reject bad theories and separate them from good theories. So in simple terms, you filter out the right ones versus the incorrect ones. That is correct. Yeah, this is uh, science is a creative process where you come up with new theories, but it is also a deductive process where you then filter out the theories that work and against the theories that don't work. And the way you're able to do that is through experimentation. Hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing. Hypothesis absolutely. testing. So, yeah, okay, okay, so kind of connecting question. Can, can you even have a scientific theory without experimentation? That is a good question. So I would say um, a mainstream understanding of theory would be some a theory must have predictive power which can be experimentally tested. So for most scientists out there, they would not count your idea as a theory unless it makes a prediction which can be experimentally tested. Yeah, so in general, uh, what we're saying However, is... I would say there are quote-unquote theories out there, like string theory, <laughs> which is a very popular uh, right. uh, physics unifying theory right now. They, they make predictions, but those predictions cannot be experimentally tested in the foreseeable future. And so many conservative scientists would uh, argue that it's not really a scientific theory because it cannot be tested. It may be self-consistent. It might, you know, reveal the results that we already know 
experiments uh, have shown, but it doesn't make a prediction which can be falsified through experiment. And therefore, many scientists would argue that this is not a scientific theory. So do you think this is really harmful for today's modern science? Um, I would argue that this is uh, antithetical to what everybody has believed is the backbone of science for so long. Without experiment, without uh, a way to disprove a theory, I don't see how it can qualify as science. And so uh, I would agree with what uh, Mohsen has said that uh, Lindbergh in uh, undermining or uh, diminishing the importance of experimentation to science is doing a great uh, disservice. Disservice, yeah. Like, yeah. As far as I think, I, I don't think you can have modern science without experimentation. Before, without that critical uh, component, it's just philosophy. You're Absolutely. just you're you're just coming up exactly. with uh, explanations. It's like ideas, ideas that and they, everyone can. And then these are possibilities. Possibilities. Yeah. Possibilities. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so as a conclusion to the Greek era, before I close it off, I would just like to say something about the intellectual achievement of the Greeks. Even though their ideas don't qualify as scientifically modern, they were still highly sophisticated ideas, and they were coming from people in an era where most of humanity was just worrying about how not to die all the time. Like today, if you just take away air conditioning from modern societies, like half the people won't be able to function. Like society would come to a crash if you just stop air conditioning. And yet these guys were sitting around 2,500 years ago without running water, talking about the meaning of life, the nature of existence, of reality itself. Uh, that's, that should be mind blowing to all of us, I think. So all due respect to the Greeks, it's not them we have a problem with. It's the historians who are writing about them. For example, in order to support his own claims, Grant asked some very ridiculous questions like, quote, Why did science as we know it only materialize in the West? Which is funny because it didn't, as we will see in the next section. The view that Grant and Lindbergh are trying to push here is that it was Greek natural philosophy that was the basic foundation of modern science. And everything else, i.e. rigorous experimentation, is not really that important. What's most problematic here is that Grant even admits that European scientists who came after the Muslims were anti-Greek natural philosophy. He cites Galileo himself as holding the opinion that Greek natural philosophy was the enemy of this new science. And Grant admits that all the effort that historians like him have put into championing Greek natural philosophy as the real father of modern science have mostly failed. But I think even that's a little bit deceptive, because they should be giving themselves a lot more credit than that. You know, they were able to basically make world history skip over the Muslim era of scientific development. And when I say skip over, they all talk about it, so it's not like they ignore it completely. The way they talk about it is replete with these standard classical narrative assumptions that we're going to talk about next with George Celeba critiquing those assumptions while also providing a corrected alternative 